You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm April Lawson, and I'm here with Luke Phillips and Tara Burton. I'm so happy to be with you guys today. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Yeah, um, Tara, thank you so much for joining us. It's uh, this. I think will be honestly. I'm I'm just really excited for this conversation because, as you all will hear in a minute, Tara has a really interesting take on. Um, the sort of religious underpinnings of a lot of the political uh, discord that we see and just the different perspectives that come to bear. And so I feel like um, regular listeners to our podcast will know that we often have different kinds of conversations. And I feel like this one might be like more outside the box and and thought provoking than usual. So I'm very excited about it. Um, Uh, To to back up on that a little bit too, I've known Tara for probably less than six months now. Um, But my God, every time I see anything written by her, she's one of maybe four or five authors that uh, whenever I see anything by her, I always, <laughs> even if it's on a topic that I find completely boring, just because her like perspective and her way of integrating all kinds of way of th- ways of thinking about this stuff uh, opens up all kinds of doors. Um, somebody wise once said that every modern political dispensation is basically a uh, recycling of some early Christian heresy or some ancient pre-Socratic naturalistic metaphysics, and there's nothing new under the sun. And a lot of people say that these days, but Tara, I think it's fair to say in a lot of her analysis and work kind of goes and applies that insight and goes and looks at a lot of the uh, kind of uh, spiritual and epistemic foundations of how a lot of us see the political world, the spiritual world, and the social world as well. So um, Tara, would you like to uh, go ahead and give a quick just introduction of yourself perhaps? Yeah. I, Luke, excellent job embarrassing her. I, yes, we're definitely going to use this video now because <laughs> I just love your facial expression. Um, and yeah, if you could just share with us your background, that'd be awesome. Sure. Um, so I, I wear many hats. I started out as a, an academic theologian across the pond and uh, then, uh, as I mentioned to, to you off the podcast, realized I liked it when more than three people read what I wrote. And so transitioned uh, from a doctorate in um, the theology of creation in the decadent, dandiest novel of late 19th century France uh, to a job in uh, new media. So I worked as a Vox, uh, Vox.com's religion correspondent for about 18 months. And then uh, I left to write. Uh, and oh, good thing about having a video on here. Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World, out June 16th from Public Affairs. Uh, and I, uh, I write about theology and religion and the internet and weird alt-right uh, sub forums and self-creation and dandyism and just like weird online things, but also God and the occult. Uh, that, is, that is my wheelhouse. Um, I'm so glad when my mother said, what on earth are you going to do with a degree in theology? Um, this apparently uh and i uh, also uh, wrote a novel called social creature which was out in 2018 um and uh mostly just finding ways to talk about the extreme surreal nature of um 2020 which which is a trip totally you can say that again i think that the <laughs> uh yeah, like I said, so interesting. And I'm, I guess I'm just curious, just to sort of a, this is a basic question. And I, you know, I have Luke here for all the, the words like pre-Socratic metaphysics. Um, I, <laughs> if you care to define anything as you say it, Luke, I will be grateful. But the, um, I, uh, I'm interested in just sort of what your observations are on what we're going through. Obviously, right now, when we're like at the time of recording this podcast, there are riots and there's a lot going on there and I'm interested in your analysis of that um, if insofar as you want to talk about it but also just your assessment of 2020 and sort of what are the it really does feel sometimes like there are old archetypes or like mythologies that are coming to the fore that we just haven't seen in years and years and years and the sort of bland protestant 
ethic of our parents' generation, or I'm sure my parents at least would be like, no, 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 that's my parents. But um, that uh, that is just, boy, something else is afoot. Um, what do you what do you see? Absolutely. So to speak a little bit more broadly about, I'd say the post 2016 moment. Um, there was a joke, a meme circulating around that time, or right around the time of Donald Trump's election, that America has jumped the shark, or this season of America is 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 sure wacky, huh? And I think it was, you know, it was a meme, but it was also a very telling one because I think mm -hmm. what we see in the sort of post twenty sixteen moment is this kind of odd juxtaposition of um, what I call my book a, a new great awakening, a new period mm -hmm. of spiritual fervor, um, albeit uh, spirituality that is not uh, expressed through traditional religious channels, but also the flip side, this very odd kind of ironic aestheticization of experience through digital channels, through both the way in which um, so many of us, especially now as we uh, sit in our homes, um, experience the world at second order, at a remove. There's a degree to which uh, reality becomes a kind of, we at once hunger for meaning, hunger for purpose, and yet experience these things in such a mediated way. I, I was struck, um, uh, Ross Douthat puts this really well in his book on decadence when he talks about, you know, the street fights of another era, the, and I mean, this I suppose was true up till about a week ago, and you can think of that, um, but often being uh, transmuted into the Twitter wars of today, that there's a sort of odd alienation from experience. And I think that there's a bit of a sort of Ouroboros, the self-eating snake of, um, of distance and alienation and the spiritual fervor where um, I, I've said this on other, so just, just to draw back a bit, when I talk about spiritual fervor, 72%, um, uh, actually let me rephrase that, about a quarter of Americans and um, as many as 36% of Americans born after 1985 say that they don't belong to a religious tradition. They're uh, religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, or religiously unaffiliated, as, um, which I think is the, the more useful term. However, that doesn't mean they're, they're atheists or even agnostic. Now, it's true the um, atheists and agnostics don't tend to undersell report, but 72% of the religiously unaffiliated say they believe in a higher power. 20% of them say they believe in the Judeo-Christian God, as the uh, poll puts Interesting. it. So, you know, when we talk about uh, so many people in this country in particular, we're not talking about people who are, um, don't have a, have a religious faith, or even who, people who sort of like vaguely have one, but, you know, as I think was the case in like the classical Protestant mid-century as of a, a certain generation of like, you go to church for Christmas and Easter, and maybe on Sunday to see your, your community members or sort of equivalents of that in, in other religious traditions. Um, but you know, you don't believe it. There is um, an extremely large and growing contingent of people who I think see firsthand the kind of alienation that comes from the way in which institutional religions have uh, failed to garner public trust, um, and this is sort of true of institutions more broadly in 2016, I would say, but also ways in which a kind of loosey-goosey model of like, the just be very reductive, the anodyne, liberal, sort of vague model of, eh, be a good person, do whatever, but like, don't think too seriously about the metaphysics, um, has actually failed to capture something for which we hunger. Um, a really interesting statistic is that while I think one might think and the sort of popular wisdom holds that people who leave uh, religion, uh, Christianity in particular do so because it's too restrictive or too repressive, it's actually far more likely for someone to leave or to no longer affiliate if their parents did not speak about religion much in the home. Um, the people who are, are joining the unaffiliated are not like le by and large leaving fundamentalist homes. Um, they're leaving versions of the religion that like were not a big deal growing up to begin with. Interesting. And so, hmm. I think that sense of that, that kind of hunger for something different, for something non-institutional, for something um, one might even say post-liberal, um, if one were being, uh, being provocative, which I certainly am not. Um, but uh, I think there is also the fact that one can play with these ideas and one can 
uh, seek them out, but do so in this digital landscape where, you know, on the one hand, it means you can meet people who share your views, your curiosities, create these communities online, but also the sort of oddness of experiencing them at second order of, let's say, you get as, as is very common, perhaps one of the most common, um, one of the most quickly growing religious groups is, is modern witchcraft and versions of um, either straight up Wicca, the, the religion, or sort of variations on that in the wider um, occult or, or um, pagan space. Um, though, you know, you might well get really into that on Tumblr, but then, you know, part of part of practice might mean buying your products and if and maybe you end up buying them at, you know, Sephora or Sephora, as I think they, Sephora? Sephora, which sold, you know, a witch kit as part of its um, starter witch kit. Uh, um, it sold, this, excuse me, reframe. It sold a starter witch kit in, I believe, 2017 or 2018 until um, people objected and I didn't. Um, but th the way in which we then consume in this sort of odd, somewhat dystopian, late capitalist nightmare of a world where our identities are so rooted in what we buy, what, how we define our affinities, our choices, and how those choices are expressed financially. I, I, I read this newspaper, I listen to this podcast, I click on this article, my algorithms look like this. This is how I build not simply an identity, but a brand. It's somewhat, it's outward focused as well in that sense towards, towards others. Th there's a, there becomes a sort of feedback of there's a hunger for something real and yet the ways in which we try to uh, approach or process the real are, are all the more unsatisfying for that degree of remove. And I think that creates the sort of bizarre alienation that lends itself to, um, to bring it back to the present uh, day very briefly, um, 4chan derived accelerationist groups like the sort of boogaloos calling for a new civil war suddenly inserting themselves into um, a uh, an unrelated protest in order to sort of see the world burn it's like it's like we're just watching the 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 joker in the dark night become the model of a certain kind of uh often masculine performance I so think that's it, where we are, I think. It's interesting that you bring pop culture into it right at the very end there too, actually, Tara. Um, because, uh, yeah, the Joker, either in its Dark Knight format or in its more recent cinematic uh, iteration, uh, tells a story that is um, fundamentally uh, a, a, a human story, but it's not like a kind of, uh, a, it, to the degree that there's a cynicism in it, it's almost a mystical kind of, uh, and, and psychological and even spiritual kind of look at things. And you know, the, um, and you probably have thought much more about this than I have, but I, it occurred to me the other day that uh, for everybody who suggests that America is a disenchanted, uh, secularizing postmodern world where uh, we're all just following our uh, lowest passions and stuff like that. Uh, modern cinema doesn't really seem to reflect that at all. Uh, you look at everything that gets uh, the, the, the most highest rated movements, and yeah, sometimes they're morally inane, but they are fantastical in a very, um, uh, uh, in, in a way that I think has uh, reflections on some of the different trends in what people value in spirituality. Um, and uh, I guess like the big example is the Marvel Cinematic Universe mm -hmm. and a uh, vaguely uh, kind of uh, sometimes pantheistic and sometimes mm -hmm. Gnostic, but it's not entirely clear what it is in, in broad strokes. But I don't know. I mean, uh, do you have any thoughts on like pop culture and the non-decline of uh, religious sentiment? Sure, absolutely. So actually the, uh, the first chapter of my book deals very strongly with this, but something that I find fascinating is the way in which um, pop culture and our response to it and the way in which particularly in I'd say since 2003 or so uh, we sort of receive culture as itself so it's, it's an underrated part of the contemporary spiritual landscape and the example I give in my book is the popularity of the Harry Potter books. Um, remember when everyone said Harry Potter is going to change the religious landscape it's gonna make us all witches and everyone thought that was crazy and like it kind of was crazy 
by their understanding of what would happen, but they were also kind of right. Um, that did happen. And the way in which this happened, I would say, is that Harry Potter fandom was a great example because it took hold of the national imagination around the time that private at home uh, internet usage or at home internet became uh, commonplace. I think between the third and fourth Harry Potter books, I want to say, internet household um, usage per house in, let me rephrase that, uh, internet access in the American household increased by like a thousand percent or something ridiculous like that. And what that meant was there was instituted this new model by which you would, you, you wouldn't just go see a movie, have you maybe have a response to it that was inward, go home. Suddenly your response to a, a text and particularly these kind of texts that became cultural watersheds was mediated through these communal experiences of it and then through the rise of things like fan fiction which had been a kind of fringe thing in the 70s and 80s via print via zines and um, star trek fandom in particular but now once sort of internet fan fiction and internet fan culture became a thing it became so much more participatory in our relationship with texts and cultural mythos mythi became so much uh, more of a dialogue like, i think it's quite funny that internet discourse will often refer to showrunners of a sh TV show you're a fan of as TPTB, the powers that be. You know, we're, we live in an era where, you know, we are not, we do not take a text and kind of that be the end of it. It's, it's not hierarchical. There's a sense in which we feel even entitled to ownership of, of that text, to reimagine it, reframe it, refract it, such that the experience of seeing a Marvel movie isn't just about like, did I like it or not? It's, did the, did the producers do a good job? Did they, you know, give us what we wanted? There's a sort of fan service idea and giving the fans what they want. And then the discourse around it becomes as much of the community as the actual experience of the thing. And then you get to sort of flash forward again to Harry Potter, these really interesting phenomenon where uh, JK Rowling, for example, um, has alienated a lot of her fan base uh, because of, um, transphobic things she has said that um, many of her fans, particularly her fans who are uh, progressive and who see often the, the messages of the Harry Potter books they grew up with as being kind of leading towards a vision, moral vision of progressivism, um, feel betrayed by, by, by this author. And the response isn't as it may well have been at, at one time, oh, well, I'm not going to read Harry Potter anymore. It's, well, she doesn't own Hogwarts. Like, we still have it. There have been you know, calls like read fan fiction, don't read the original, like read these new versions. This world belongs to us as much as it belongs to this woman who, who created it, but who does not own it. And I think that's just this fascinating and, and, uh, and you know, and, and exciting. And, and one might say, um, when, uh, even a kind of odd return to a kind of pre-print vision of, of storytelling, where it is a communal endeavor, it is a dynamic endeavor. It is not simply the communication of a hierarch uh, with the power of language to silent listeners. And I, I you know, that, that, that can be quite exciting. It can be also, uh, at times, I think, I think it's also the model for a sense of participation, a demand for participation that has infused how we think um, more broadly in 2020 about politics and also about religion, the idea that, you know, you, you are not receiving a text, you are not receiving an idea, you are entitled to sounds um, more judgmental than I mean it, but that there is something about your understanding of yourself as a human being that means that it is not just like good for you, but also morally good, morally demanded that you take ownership of your own stories and a relationship with stories in such a way and I think absolutely sorry just, sorry. just to finish to go yeah. back to your original question because I think I was sidestepping it a bit a, a bit Luke I think so much of the enchantment we see around these texts and I think often I will say like I I'm not a huge Marvel fan to be honest um but I will say that often it feels like there is a sort of genericism to which I think you were getting at Luke to a lot of the fantasy of a superhero film precisely because you know they're just sort of throwing something out there and then it's taken up and reimagined and reframed and it's all the easier to do that when it's sort of 
general or inoffensive, like good versus evil, love triumphs over all, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't have to do much more than that because I think people receiving it and playing with it and reimagining it do so much more of the intellectual and metaphysical work, shall we say. Well, just as a slight aside, as you were uh, mentioning the uh, capacity of fandoms to become almost like semi, uh, semi uh, cultish in this kind of thing, I was thinking, oh, huh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not that kind of person. And then I remembered, oh, wait a second. I absolutely hate the Star Wars sequels and absolutely love Star Wars Rogue One and The Mandalorian and have made no, no effort to contain my feelings either direction and have gone so far with some of my other fellow Star Wars traditionalists to excommunicate the sequels and uh, promote Rogue One and The Mandalorian as real Star Wars. So, so at a personal level, I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, I, I'm as guilty of this as anybody else is too, actually. So. Yeah. You, you have that religious revolution against uh, the powers that be. <laughs> you rise up. You be a, a Star Wars person. I thought the sequels were fine, but honestly, I don't really particularly like the originals either. So they're all kind of the same to me. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so I was going to say something similar, Luke, that like I, I haven't analyzed this from a, in a sort of anthropological way like you just did, but I have definitely said... Um, so I resented the Harry Potter movies. I'm a Harry Potter purist and I resented the movies because I didn't think they should make the movies until the books were complete because, uh, and I resented some of the casting and I was like, well, that's not the real Hermione. That's not the, the one person I thought was really well cast was Hagrid. Um, I thought Hagrid was excellent and Ron. Ron was <laughs> very good. Um, but I very much had a like, well, that's okay. The movies don't have to represent it because like, you know, it's in my heart. It's in our hearts. We know what the real thing, like the, the, the form, uh, the platonic form of Harry Potter isn't that anyway. So, and it's just, I, I love your point about how we, we um, are claiming ownership of these stories in almost a pre, uh, pre-written word way. And I guess my question is, um, where do you think that comes from? And I, I ask in the context of uh, so I, one of my personal views and one of the reasons I'm so interested in your work and, and work with Braver Angels and do the work that I do is that I think that um, most, uh, many of the passions in our politics come from an insufficient meeting of spiritual need in, this, in the society. And I'm interested in what you think of that. It sounds like also people are finding community in this, like they're, there's a very strong like creation of community that perhaps is replacing a, or like filling a void there. What, what are the drives that are leading people to engage this way? Um, and, and also just how do you see that show up in the sort of political sphere? Um, yeah. You are muted. There there's a truism that there's as many definitions of um, a religion as there are scholars of religion, and that, that's certainly true. So it's difficult to, to narrow it down, but I think roughly speaking, and, and in my book, I kind of, I fudge it a bit, and then I say, all right, there's, there's around four things we can sort of usefully talk about as constitutive of a religion, and those are um, meaning, you know, what's, what's it all about? Uh, purpose, which is, I think, uh, slightly different, which is what is my role in what's it, it all about? How am I often, how am I the hero of this story? How, what is my, like, the way in which my life intersects with the cosmic narrative? I, um, there's community, pretty self-explanatory. And there's ritual, you know, ways in which measurable ways I or anyone can act such that my daily life lines up with my purpose, which then lines up with the meaningfulness of the world. And I think that something that we can see in um, a lot of disparate political movements is a kind of vision of the self as mattering in this kind of cosmic drama. And I think that the idea of kind of the self as hero, the self as um, meaningful, living a meaningful life with a kind of eschatological purpose that is a a newer world or a better world in many cases. Um, in, in some cases and in more insidious cases, there's a bit of a sort of, um, and I see, I think one sees this a lot in like 4chan nihilism, this kind of acceleration, like I just want to watch the world burn and like see the end of history because it's exciting, uh, which I think is the, the sort of 
most in, a very insidious form of it. But I think that if a comparison can be drawn, it is a sense of, of moral and historical purpose. And I think more broadly, it is the case Fabulous. that our, our contemporary religions, such as they are, like wellness culture, uh, engender what I call a kind of best selfism. They focus on turning inward, f focusing on the self, focusing on um, self-care as this kind of spiritualized concept. And fundamentally, this risks being a kind of nihilistic enterprise, which is to say, you know, one ach achieves a kind of like, you have your perfect skin and you meditate enough and you drink a lot of water, but where does this sort of tie in with something greater, something historical? Exactly, keep drinking that water. Um, but, and I think that what political movements um, of, of a variety of directions ha have done successfully is capture from our more intuitionalist inward looking age a kind of epistemology of of intuition of the self of the gut um hmm. and mm -hmm. yet map that onto something that is eschatologically clearer that involves um something like it involves a vision of world history and not just stasis it's very good very good I want to pull this back to uh, back to politics here, um, just given the uh, the. We were talking about politics, Luke. That was well, totally about politics. It's all but, politics. It's all theology. That's right. All politics is Nothing personal. Nothing is not. <laughs> we, are, we are we are dangerously approaching a, mo a monistic epistemology and ontology on how on the unity of all things, but that's still good. Um, you need to find like half those words, but go on. <laughs> To, uh, to bring it a little bit closer to politics, something that a lot of people have noted, uh, and Tara, you mentioned this uh, earlier on too, um, something people have noted is that like uh, Trump and the Trump world seems like a cult of sorts. And uh, social justice warriors, to use the uh, der uh, derogative phrase that is applied to them sometimes, seem like uh, like religious puritanical activists, right? And then the polarization of the parties themselves is something that attains more a level of like religion is important within po political dispensation rather than being uh important uh in defining political dispensation and that makes for a world where religion where politics itself attains a religious character um and uh and, and then also uh i i am a huge fan of tarring uh uh obscure groups of intellectuals in DC who are uh, wondrously dedicated to one principle or other as, uh, as monks of, uh, of various sorts, just because it's fun. But uh, that being said, so, so if religious politics, I mean, if, uh, if political ideologies in America um, are like believed with a religious fervor, but religious fervor is something that is intrinsic to who we are as human beings, Tara, my question is, how do you, how is that best dealt with? Like, I, I guess uh, uh, another way of posing that is, is it necessarily a bad thing that um, that uh, the various social justice movements and the Trump populist movement and all these have a kind of quasi-religious character? Is that a bad thing or is that something that can be uh, channeled perhaps towards other kinds of things? I mean, I think, I'm not sure you can call it a bad thing or a good thing insofar as it is what it is. I think that the like it is impossible, and I think one might say always has been impossible to speak of sort of religion purely outside of politics. Insofar as any um, religion deals with other people and the idea of a common good or a common life, like it is inherently political. And so I think that well, one might say you know, I, I think that what one might want to see is a kind of discussion of how these principles fit together, how, how, in what way is there a system, what are the sort of metaphysical understandings that we're working with here. But I think that, I think it's worth saying that I, that all forms of, of what one might say are these sort of post-liberal moments, um, what they are responding to often is the, the sort of alternative, which is um, perhaps also religion in a different way, but the kind of anodyne civil religion of kind of post-boomer neoliberalism, which, um, and that's obviously a bit reductionist, but I think that 
what we're seeing are in these political groups are, are various different responses to failings of a certain kind of civil religion that has failed to effectively unite, govern, um, inspire, protect its, its populace. Um, so th to that extent, I think rather than say, is this religious or not, one might talk more usefully about these, these as sort of grassroots or intuitionalist or what have you, religions versus institutional civil religions, using that as a category to include not, ju not just like mainline Protestant Christianity, but the intersection of mainline Protestant Christianity with like a certain kind of boomer ideology, a certain notion of civic life, et cetera, et cetera. I think there is a bit of a pendulum swing back and forth and it may well be that one uh, or the other movement sort of starting with a degree of, of fervor and um, opposition and inwardness becomes institutionalized in a certain way and then we go through all this over again. Although I think the internet and the way in which internet culture, participatory culture has made us all sort of made the grassroots experience so much uh, more heightened or you know the sort of hyper reality that we live in. I, I, I don't know what, what institutionalization would look like through the age of Twitter. I think we kind of have to wait and see on this one. Totally. So <laughs> I knew this was going to be fascinating. I would love to have this conversation, like even if it weren't recorded oh. or any part of my job. It's great. Gotta get drinks so, in DC when I'm down. Oh, absolutely. And when we're allowed to go outside. But anyway, yes, the, um, although actually I think we are allowed to go literally outside right now. Oh. So next time. Yeah. Um, so I love what you just said. And I'm interested in, so at Better, Braver Angels, we have been talking about our core values and how to message them in a way that is more provocative because yes. one of the problems of our space is that it's very hard to as you say civic civil religion and the boy there is so much in the depolarization space that sounds a lot like please just be can't we all be nice mm -hmm. to each other right and i don't know about other people this is why i never thought i was going to work for an organization like this because like my reaction to that is like gag me with a spoon that is so uninspiring and so um it misses the human experience in such a deep way and the uh and yet and so the word that like we actually want to use or that i think we should use more of and some others agree with me is love but that word doesn't play well uh it's not a good messaging word for a variety of reasons and yet there is um so we're talking about principles right different mm -hmm. um different groups that are devoted to a principle uh and i'm interested in one of the things that gives me hope is that, in my view, the best version of any religion has um, a, a non-anodyne heart, right? It has a strong, uh, sort of viscerally real um, heart, which has, has love in there, has justice, has mercy, has faith, has like a lot of those things. And uh, yet we ha keep ending up with a civic space that's very, denude that's like very bland right and so my question is um just uh what do you think it would take for so you know more about this than i do but it seems to me that the newer religions one of the things that scares me about them uh the orthodoxies on the left and the sort of anti-truthism on the right um is that they seem uh I don't know if they have all those virtues as core principles. Um, and therefore, as somebody who wants to build a, a, a coherent pluralistic society, you, you build that on top of the fact that everybody basically believes in love and justice and mercy and, and faith. And like some of those, those are sort of Christian words, but like most religions have the equivalent of that. And that's, that has been my assumption for how we can build a shared polity. Um, and a shared civic culture that is actually satisfying to the soul. Um, and I guess my question is, do you see that, those virtues in the newer forms? And if not, um, how can we build them? Like, is there a way to push those movements towards what I would call some of the higher virtues of society that can both compel the soul and give us 
an ability to live together? Um, so I, I wouldn't, in the, I'd have to go case by case to talk about the individual sort of new religions. It's like, I do not see love, uh, justice and truth anywhere uh, it, it, close to any of the sort of reactionary, what I call the atavist religions in there. I think, you know, there is, there, uh, those, those may be a, quite a lost cause as far as that is concerned. I would make the case, you know, I, I do, th I say certainly in, in the social justice activist movement, and again, that's a reductionist term, I do see much more, um, much more of a sort of utopian vision of a better world. I think, you know, it may be our most successful new religion in that it has um, sort of a, a, a you know, a, a better world that is juster and fairer and truer and that should be defended. That said, I think that what our new religions more broadly do have in common is a recognition of the kind of contingency and maybe even fictif fictitiousness of a neutral public square. Like, I don't think, I, I, I think that the, 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 the sort of the, dia the difficult of the dialogue space is that the more, the more space you make to have that dialogue, the more you carve out a place in which genuine difference in ideology matter less. And the question for me is how, how does one preserve a space for discourse? And I, where, and I think, uh, Luke, you used this phrase earlier in the conversation before the podcast, but epistemic humility to say, this, is, this discussion is predicated not on the idea that these values don't matter or that we can put them aside in order to shake hands like gentlemen, which I think is the danger is of the kind of vision of neutrality is the idea that politeness, that a sort of good, you know, a pleasant dinner party conversation is somehow important enough to say that values can be put aside. If we can frame the space for dialogue rather as one of we as human beings, imperfect as we are, um, are missing something even in, in the values that we most deeply hold. It's not that, you know, we may be wrong, we may have overlooked something, the truth is likely much more complicated than we are capable of, then I think recognizing the sheer contingency of the public space as a kind of best available option to have conversations between people, uh, among people who really genuinely differ and where de like debate being robust is, is almost in a sense more respectful precisely because it is saying you believe this and it is integral to your worldview and your worldview is real, you hold it, there are values to it, rather than a kind of narrative of like, well, let's find common ground, but in so doing, shunting aside a genuine engagement totally. with, with, you know. Totally. And I, I think that I, I would, I often find them, I, um, that when I have a conversation with someone with whom I really, really disagree, just sort of hearing the totality of that disagreement and saying, all right, like this person thinks I'm 100% wrong, but you know, I will at least sort of, and I recognize that I as a human flawed person, like I'm probably wrong about a lot of things all the time. That, that seems to me a better, or a way, of, a way of going about it. I'm not sure what that means in, in, in practice or for policy, I mean, but I do think that what these new religions do recognize and I think hunger for and what might, you know, w in kind of rejecting quote unquote liberal civility, I think the good of that, um, and, and often I see this in the, the this, is, this is where I sort of will defend the, the social just, justice space in particular, I think the language of, of, of tone policing or suspicion of civility at times can, can be, you know, ha has been mocked as, as this kind of, certain kind of zealotry but i think a truth that they're getting at is like things things matter and things can't not matter just because we want to have a pleasant conversation which is totally. a something very different from but we still have to like functionally work together regardless absolutely i'm just a quick follow-up there um the this is why so shameless plug for the my um personal like little corner of better angels is, is, excuse me, braver angels is braver angels debates. And it's these exact values. That's why I think that like debate is, um, there's a lot of uh, dialogue and that's all, 
there are many parts of this puzzle, right? But I, I, firm, I could not agree more that debate has to be part of it. And I have found, I don't know about you, but I have found that I've had a number of those conversations where I'm like, wow, we don't agree about like anything, like not a single thing. And really our moral systems are not compatible. Um, mm -hmm. But I find that there is still a, um, one of my favorite values is brotherhood. And mm -hmm. I find that that's still, and that's another example of uh, mm -hmm. one of those that I think is actually robust and compelling in, and not um, about, I think tone policing is so real and it's not about quieting and, and civilizing the emotions mm -hmm. and those things. Um, and I find that that, I, that brotherhood is palpable anyway. Um, and so I, I just, yeah, I wanted to say I agree completely. And um, the, I wish that more organizations would integrate debate and sort of structured conflict mm. into their, um, their attempts to uh, weave a social fabric that, is, that actually has space for everyone. I think there's also something, uh, a really profound implication uh, to what you're saying, Tara, and what you, what you're, how you're analyzing this about um, the nature of, uh, of what consensus is. One, uh, so April mentioned uh, one of the annoying habits of, uh, of people in this space, which is just be nice to each other and everything's good. Uh, but I, one of the other annoying habits of people in this civil discourse space that I always find is you, you see a lot of uh, boundary setting, I think, uh, where people say, okay, so people are allowed to disagree on taxes, but they're not allowed to disagree on race or on the flag or on the value of history or stuff like that, right? Um, and so you, you get this like kind of rationalistic promotion of the civil religion uh, where you, where the the creation of order in that world comes from the top down, and uh, the the notion of what is acceptable is uh, and, and what is tolerable and what principles everybody should uh, should have to agree by is basically susceptible to the rational prejudices of whoever is coming up with that particular system, right? Uh, and this is what I absolutely hate. Every two or three years, whenever the Atlantic or National Review rediscovers the concept of American identity, uh, they always have like like a, like a list of like either five or ten or fifteen like aspects of American identity. And if you hit all of these, you're a real American. And if you miss one of these or have something else, you're not a real American. Like, like I mean, they don't say it that way, but uh, in a in a in a way, that's kind of what a lot of condemnations of people as un-American kind, of, uh, kind of go into, right? But what you're saying is you're looking at, uh, at disagreement and the production of consensus from the bottom up. You're suggesting, uh, if I'm reading you right, that there's a sense in which you can't really get to a rationally coherent consensus at all that can uh, encompass the breadth of uh, of human potential and the breadth of human uh, just differences uh, in any society, maybe even down to the family unit or the friend group too, you know. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that consensus is not possible. It's, it's like the, uh, the, the being able to see each other, being able mm. to, uh, to, to have radically different ways of life that probably shouldn't exist in the same polity. Um, but being able to have them exist in a non-destructive kind of uh, kind of union builds a kind of new consensus above those that has more spiritual meat in it, but less mm. rational bone in it. You know, um, so uh, which is a really scary thought because we're a nation that prides ourselves on like being a nation of ideals and stuff like that. Uh, but the thought that like are anarchists as much a part of the American experiment as we are? Are uh, some of these crazy white supremacists as much a part of the American experiment as we are? And like having the courage to say, yes, they are, they might be wrong, they might be crazy, we don't wanna elevate them or anything, but we can't just destroy them, you know, is a, is a, is a, is a weird kind of thing. But I think it, it, it flows to some degree from this kind of pluralism, you know? I mean, I'm trying to think of how to put this. Um, I think what simply what I mean, but I, I resist the other implication too, which is to say, like, I, I would like a 
um, I would, you know, I would like a society oriented towards the common good, um, such that there is absolutely in the society that I would like to live in and see, um, see enacted around me, like, there is absolutely no place for crazy white supremacists in that society. There's absolutely no place for, um, you know, anything of that nature in the society. No, I, I, I'm not, uh, would that I knew enough about the common good to be able to tell you more about uh, the society that I would uh, like to replicate. But I will say this, and I think that a way to the, a way to talk about discourse is, I think, to have robust views about what constitutes a good society. And it may be, you know, I think if your robust view about what constitutes a good society is pluralism and debate, then that is an is de facto a robust view, and there is space in that society for a very broad conception of um, the public space of neutrality of one's beliefs being sort of private. At the same time, it does run a risk of you know allowing white supremacists to post post a lot on the society's version of Twitter. Um, I think that I would like to see, or I would be curious. Let's say not like to see. I would be curious about and would love to sort of witness the results of a society that took a stronger position towards the things that I value, which includes sort of, to go back to your conversation of love, um, to, uh, economic equality, for example. I think, I, think I, I know that insofar as I know that you're a conservative, Luke, I imagine my, the society I would like to see was, would perhaps look a little different uh, in its first principles than yours, perhaps not. Um, but I think that I think that pretending or sort of playing along to the fiction that um, neutrality rests on neutral principles is dangerous because I think, you know, m maybe, and I'm, again, it's, nothing I say here is binding. I, I'm enjoying this conversation and sort of spitballing a bit, but to have a community that robustly owns its vision of liberalism and the neutral public space and this being sort of what it means to live in this society in in this imaginary world which then again sort of locks us into choosing societies the way we choose our facebook feeds and thus sort of giving leading us back into the sort of mire of late capitalism but in this in this thought experiment i would i would rather see a liberal society that kind of owns its liberalism as a value than the idea that this is simply the default and that it is in and of itself neutral. Absolutely. Yeah, could not agree more. Um, the, the refusal of little L liberalism to recognize itself as an ideology or at least a philosophy is <laughs> I mean, a there, function of elitism, among other things. Um, absolutely. And there yeah. is so much good, I mean, there's so much produ productive good to be had in dialogue with the liberal vision when oh, yeah. it recognizes itself as such, but when it doesn't recognize itself as sort of an ideology, you also don't get to talk about what in this ideology might be worth preserving, what might be worth, what, what, what needs to be critiqued. And I think that Absolutely. that's sort of a, a big, you know, we, we, th those are conversations I would like to, you know, these are debates I would like to watch on uh, Braver Angels debates. And, and, um, Unfortunately for you, I'll drag you into speaking at them too, because <laughs> there's a lot to say. I mean, because this stuff is really important and it's, it's undergirding. This is why these conversations are so, so fun, right? Is that this is, it, I feel like these are the tectonic plates and mostly we pay attention to the mountain ranges and to the explosion, like, you know, to the stuff that's actually on the land, but these are the plates underneath them. And I um, completely agree with the, uh, I guess my question is, um, I agree that liberalism should uh, have the humility, frankly, to understand itself as a philosophy rather than, it's sort of like the idea that like democracy is just the answer. <laughs> like, it's not that I think it's the best form of government that we've come up with so far, but then isn't it Churchill who said it's the worst form except for all the others, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so the, I think liberalism is the same. And I, my, um, I identify as a conservative also, although I bet there are some ways in which you and I, Tara, would, would overlap there because um, this, this set of ideas has, has, um, is important to me in that direction. 
uh, it seems to me that it's dangerous to, that liberalism alone is dangerous because you uh, because of the thing that you're essentially saying that you if there's no um, if we commit to a means and to a form rather than to ends mm -hmm. then there's no uh, that cannot um, lift up the thing all the things that need to be lifted up and sort of uh, sanction all the things that need to be sanctioned and and create boundaries against those which shouldn't be. Um, and I guess I'm interested in, and so my ass assumption has been that that's part of where these sort of new movements, new like spiritual movements, many of which right, are not particularly pretty, um, are coming from is a, a vacuum of moral substance. And so David uh, Brooks, who I used to work with, um, at the Times talked about how, <laughs> you know, this funny phrase that we are to morality as Victorians were towards sex. Like we just won't talk about it. Like as long as we don't talk about it, everybody's fine. You do you, I'll do me, right? Like, and I'm interested in um, whether and how you see a positive vision of ends emerging because right now it looks to me, not, not to be cynical, but like, Although conservatives, we get to do that um, and be curmudgeons and all that. Anyway, it looks a little bit to me like the uh, gap, the vacuum created by little L liberalism, which understandably like came about because um, it was the best compromise among, it came after a long history of, mm -hmm. of ideologies yes. warring yeah. violently, right? So like it, it is, I see why it, it was a reasonable reaction. That's some good stuff, yeah, yeah. Yes, very much so. And a lot of the time I'd like more of it actually, but the, um, do you see, can you give me some hope basically? It looks to me like that vacuum has been filled by reaction mostly, which does not have the theological sophistication to be like balanced or to have the, the weighing of competing goods intention that most more sophisticated theologies do. Um, yeah, is it, are we doomed? Like, are we just gonna turn into like, you know, um, liberal vacuum, uh, crazy right, crazy left, um, weak moderates? Yes and no. So <laughs> I, I would frame it like this. I think that we are in a vacuum now and I think that there are some extremely toxic evil, quite evil ideologies out there. I also think that there are good ideologies out there. Are they flawed, uh, sometimes flawed? I mean, all sure. flawed, all ideologies are flawed. But I think that the fact that there is such a hung, that, are, that there is such a widespread sense that the where we are now is not enough, and that there is a renewed interest among many of these intuitional types, particularly the Zoomers, the, the kids these days, I can say that now, I'm almost 30, um, <laughs> that, that there is a sense of moral hunger, that moral certainty is something we want. And I think, I think it may be that even the kind of like more anodyne, like wellness culture might well give way to the act, you know, let's say activist culture. And I, I think that and again, although I'm quite reductionist now, I talk about social justice activism. It's it's much more um, sort of disparate and complex than I could possibly do justice to in the book. I think that a vision of a morally serious, better world, one that is that is um, takes seriously um, morality it, that doesn't see morality as taboo. These are good starting points. Like, are there? Um, mm -hmm things to work out? Yes, absolutely. Are there um, sort of people, I mean, are there, first of all, corporations who take, you know, this ideology and then turn it into their own ways of, you know, selling like, like the bidet company who wanted to come out in support of um, the protests? Like, yes, there's a, there's a sort of odd version of, of it being co-opted by uh, corporate interests. But I think that wh whatever your sort of sense political ideology which is say whichever your sense of um what a good governance looks like what what where or what the power of the state should be or any of these questions i think we should all be optimistic that the kids care about the common good and while these are debates that are being had and may even not be had in civil ways um i would much rather the common good be under discussion 
then live in a world where we are so focused on atomized individualism, where we are focused on consumption and a particular notion of self-care that begins and ends with, you know, our conscious, let alone actual spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. And I think talking about true things and goodness, I am, opti I am optimistic that those, that those conversations will lead us somewhere productive. Mm -hmm. if not always in the the most tactful or <laughs> I think I think this is a, a great sort of how, how much more hopeful can we be yeah okay so Luke I have a quick follow-up and then I want to be mindful of time you have the last question but I just have to follow up with this um which is uh but first of all do you what do you think about the epistemology of the social justice left mm -hmm. and uh and it seems to me that, and you acknowledge that there are things to be worked out. And I completely agree. I prefer this to apathy. One of the reasons I love living in DC is that everybody cares about something. You might care about something I think is terrible, but they definitely care. And, and that's like, that's good, right? Like passion is, um, the worst thing is, is that old Yeats poem about uh, the worst, what are full of passion intensity. Like all, yeah. What's that's the first like all part? Ambition. Yeah. And the worst are full of passion. Intensity. That's right. Thank you. Yes. Right. So that's, that's, we don't have that. And that's great. Um, and I agree with that. Um, and it seems to me that the social justice left is uh, really damaging to the social fabric. And it's not at all clear to me that they're, they have a vision, but it's not, I, I'm, I worry a lot that their means will destroy their vision and that, or, or society in the meantime, and that the, um, that there's no mercy, forgiveness, like complex conceptions of justice. Um, I know you acknowledge that there are things to work out mm -hmm. and I agree with you that that's a hopeful starting point, but um, I don't know, I'm pretty scared of that too. Uh, mm -hmm. Thoughts? Sure, so I'm, I'm going to sort of step in in a more personal way from my own, so I, I would identify in so far as I, as I'm, I'm a progressive Christian, and um, I, I, in so far as um, my Christianity is informed by sort of liberation theology and, and other movements in that in that system, but at the same time, I, I sort of see see my starting point and how I see the world as a sort of a, as, as a Christian first, albeit leftist Christian, one might say. And I think that one of the the things that that I the way that I think about it. So I'm not going to sort of make a prescriptive sort of comment, but just how I would think about forgiveness that I think is a useful hermeneutic that I use is this sort of, the, the sort of radical, the, both the radical elements of Christianity are twofold. And one is, from my perspective, the radical is nature of, you know, a God who becomes man and a king who comes in on an ass and this idea of hierarchy and reversal where, yes, earthly unjust powers ought to be overthrown. There is a degree of violence there in the sense of you know Jesus overthrowing the temple that there is there is no there is a radicalism in the call for equality it, at the same time and I think that this is why you know this is why I'm a Christian there the every single human person is made in the image of God and that is a fundamental part of the Christian um, understanding of the world you cannot look at another human being whoever they are except through the lens of the Imago Dei. And, and, that, and that is to say, to see them in their embodied self, in their socially determined self, at the nexus of, both at the nexus of various identities that have formed them and shaped them, um, in, you know, both as, as embodiments, but also that there is an irreducible, irreducible and irreproducible element to their personhood, which to say someone is not simply a nexus of all the identities, there is, something else that defines them, that makes them human, that makes them distinct. And I think balancing those two for me um, w would involve both a kind of willingness to be sort of violent against systems, one might say, and still preserve that when a, a vision of the interaction of the particular, where it's my relationship to one person, to their, you know, always involves forgiveness, always involves mercy, always involves turning the other cheek, and yet my response to systems, to institutions is quite different. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know how one, I do not know how that translates to 
a secular framework or to, let's say, a social justice framework that is not rooted in this particular theology, but is rooted in another, I can't speak to that. But I will say that I imagine that no system that does not that is that does not sort of have a mechanism for recognizing the full humanity of the other um, can be, in my mind, fully complete. Again, that's Beautiful. why I'm a Christian coming from from a, from a, from a biased mm -hmm. perspective, but mm -hmm. and would be very interested to hear and learn how restorative justice or conversations mm -hmm. happen in let's say a secular social justice context. Absolutely, right, that's, that's my question too. Totally, um, Luke, you should, you should go. I could keep going for a long time. Well, uh, being mindful of time, I'm just going to uh, make, a, make a quick point about uh, the salience of Tara's work and then we'll, uh, uh, Tara, I think you deserve a uh, chance to, uh, to uh, um, build your book uh, before we finish things. Oh, up. very happily. Uh, but um, for those uh, for those regular listeners and followers of Braver Angels, y'all know that one of the things that makes us different from a lot of other organizations is uh, even in the same space, even in the red blue civil discourse space, is that uh, at some level, um, I think the corpus of practices that we do when we're going into workshops and uh, and the values that we hold in organizing ourselves, like red blue balance. Um, and uh, speaking in I statements rather than these statements and stuff like that. Uh, the, the sum of all that basically makes for a, uh, a lifestyle when we're engaging with politics that encourages epistemic humility and uh, something that our good friend John uh, coined as patriotic empathy, right? Being able to uh, see, feel things strongly, but also still question your, your beliefs and your feelings and maybe understand them better. Do the same thing for other people and uh, view them as fundamentally human. And uh, the wonderful thing that I think, and I mentioned this at the top, but I'll say it again, the wonderful thing that I think Tara's uh, work does is it just restores a human element into all these kinds of things where mm -hmm. uh, so many mm -hmm. other kind of voices in our society are talking about it as either the, uh, the apocalyptic clash of various abstract ideals or the uh, inevitable workings out of millions of years of evolutionary biology, all things that in a way deny human freedom. And uh, the, the biggest lesson from Tara's work, and I would urge everybody listening to this to look into uh, some of Tara's writings, uh, including her book, Strange Rights, is just, uh, if, you wanna, if you want a sense of, of, uh, of, the, of us being like halfway between the mundane and the, and the sacred, um, and like existing in both, but not being either of both, Tara's work is a great way to start if you wanna see how that applies directly to us right now. So, um, so Tara, would you like to uh, give a pitch for your book before we close out here? Sure. Strange Rights, New Religions for a Godless World is coming out from on June 16th from Public Affairs. You can buy it wherever books are sold. Don't buy it on Amazon if you can avoid it, but buy it on Amazon rather than not buying it at all. Um, it is about the spiritual but not religious in the new American remixed religious landscape from wellness to witches to the alt-right. Lovely. I cannot wait to read it. Um, and yeah, I just, I would second Luke that I, like I said, I think these are the tectonic plates that are driving a lot of what the other stuff that's going on. And so any, anyone who's trying to understand society and the world we're living in, um, it's, uh, this is essential. So Tara, thank you so much for joining us. This is absolutely a delight. Can't wait for you to come Beautiful. back to DC. Yeah, um, lovely. yeah. And, uh, thanks to all of our listeners. Um, Obviously, we like it when you like us and when you follow us and all that stuff. So please do those things. Um, participate in this, this Twitterified world. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>